There we go. I'm unmuted. Sorry about that little technical difficulty this morning. Um, welcome, everyone. We're glad you've joined us this morning. It is 10 a.m. and we want to be respectful of our speaker's time. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Dustin Wright, and he is the founder of Disability Cocoon. Um, and he is going to be talking to us a little bit about what kind of technological advances have been out there, especially like using phones and tablets and applications um, that would be a benefit for people with disabilities. And I'm hearing some background noise. So I'm going to mute some people. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to Dustin and make him the presenter and let him get started. And it's all yours, Dustin. And um, questions will be at the end. So please type those into the chat box. And at the end, we will go over those with Dustin. Great. And I am going to try to be brave enough to share my uh, <clears throat> my webcam with everyone. So hello. Um, I just feel like it uh, makes it a little bit more personal. So um, thank you for the opportunity to chat with you today about tech. Uh, tech is a and tech and supporting people with disabilities is a is a very big passion of mine. So. Appreciate the opportunity. There's lots of great things out there for case managers to improve the lives of people. And uh, excited to get to talk to you guys about this today. Um, can everyone see me, Amy, can everybody see my screen okay? Uh, Amy? Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Your screen. Great, thank you. All right, um, real quickly, um, just my background because it does kind of pertain to kind of the last part of this presentation. I started in this field as a DSP, uh, working in a group home and a waiver setting. Uh, then after school, I uh, went to work for a provider organization as a director. Uh, it was actually Indiana Mentor here in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, then in 2006, went and helped start the company Rest Assured uh, and was there building that company for 13 years until 2018 when I realized that uh, we needed to, there was not really one place across the country that was advocating for the appropriate use of technology to support people with disabilities. And that's kind of why I formed Disability Cocoon. So um, the presentation today is gonna go through a lot of the things that I've seen at Disability Cocoon over the last two years. And we're gonna kind of break this out into three different sections. The first part of this presentation, I wanna kind of talk about why why should we be looking at tech? Why, is, why do we feel that technology um, is gonna be important in the service delivery system and the way that people with disabilities receive services? Um, the first reason, I think, and it's gonna be a, a big hypothesis here, that <clears throat> change is inevitable. And we're starting to see tech uh, being utilized more and more in, in waiver programs in many states around the United States. Many states are forming what they're calling like an employment first model. They're forming technology first models where they're actually requiring in service planning that service coordinators, case managers look at technology as the first option of support, a less intrusive option of support than going to our traditional um, you know, um, RHS, DSP type supports. Um, one of the things that we have to do when we're looking at tech as a, as a form of support is make sure that we are doing this in the right way. And if we aren't the people that are doing that, <clears throat> the people that really know the individuals that we're serving, if we aren't advocating for the appropriate use of technology, it's gonna come and it's gonna come by people outside of our industry. So we have to embrace this and control this to make sure that this is done the right way. We're gonna see more and more funding options. Um, Unfortunately, Indiana is uh, one of those states that doesn't have as much funding for technology as some of the other states across the country. Uh, there are many states um, that are funding basically any form of technology, including an internet connection to support those technologies. So we're seeing more and more. I know Indiana is very excited about this and we hope to see some new opportunities um, in Indiana in the future. We all know about the workforce shortage. Enough said, right? Tech can reduce the reliance on those DSPs that are needed, not just DSPs in the home, job coaches, uh, and in other areas. I also think that um, as our as we continue to evolve as a society, the labor pool that we're drawing from is predominantly a younger labor pool, right? And they have all grown up 
with with these things in their hands and with the computers that we're using and and tech is the way that they live their life and the way that they would probably like to work so i think that our workforce expectations um, are also going to be changing and those those organizations that don't embrace technology will be kind of viewed as antiquated at some point so we need to start paying attention to this um, it's also going to allow us to refocus or re it will allow the system to refocus back to actually the individual and their needs and their desires and and working to make their lives better instead of working so hard to do all these regulatory things and i'm not saying those things aren't important because they're extremely important but the tech will allow us to manage those ancillary uh, responsibilities a little bit easier and, and and streamline our activities so that that dsp can actually have you know really empower that person to to do more in their life which which is the ultimate goal right it's also going to give us more data which will give us more insights so you guys will have real good data as case managers to look at instead of just you know taking dsp that started two weeks ago's information on what's been happening with johnny those types of things as an example will allow us to have more information about what we're doing about how the people's lives that we're serving which will allow us to provide better services to people. It's gonna allow us to um, have less waste in our system. Um, from a financial perspective, this means that the money, the pile of money that we have in our Medicaid system in Indiana can be used to support more people. Pulling some of those people from the family supports waiver to uh, CIH waiver. Those kinds of things will be able to occur uh, as tech reduces the amount of waste, both financially as well as the human resource part that we've already talked about. And you can forget everything else that I've said, just throw that all out the window. If we don't do this, then, then we've totally missed the target. We have to, when we're looking at tech, I almost tell people, don't even think tech, don't think features, don't think gadgets. Um, look at the person's needs, like you guys do on a daily basis, that's your job, right? Look at the person's needs and then go find something that could potentially work for that person. Don't get caught up in the latest, greatest thing and want to go use that and who can i apply that to it's more of let's start with the person we got to keep the person's needs front and center obviously you guys know this so i broke the rest of the presentation out into a couple of different sections i wanted to go through some of the, the tech that you can get off the shelf so if you want to go to amazon or to best buy um, and get this stuff it's available right commercially available stuff that has applications to support people with disabilities the second part is actually tech that is being developed specifically for adults with intellectual developmental disabilities. Um, so I'm going to throw a lot of things at you here, and it's going to be very, very quick. Um, so if there is one thing that kind of jumps out at you, make a note of it and um, you know, get with, with Amy or Joy or whomever at, at Advocacy Links, and they can get in touch with me, and I can get you some more information, more detailed information on these things. So. Um, to start with some of the commercially available things, um, the first thing that I wanted to go through is, and this is, I think it's just cool. Um, these are called Bose frames. They're prescription sunglasses that have built-in speakers that connect to a phone. And one, that's just cool if you just want to listen to music. But for that person that is blind, low vision, they can actually tie their, their phone, and I think I have a couple of videos here, that I'll allow to play for here in just a second, but they can tie their phone and do voiceover from their phone directly to the glasses. And you'll see how that works here. Um, gonna let this play for just a second. So it's got the feature kind of built in right there. Bluetooth connected back to the phone. And here's an example of voiceover. Voiceover talks you through what's happening on your iPhone or iPad. So you know who's calling or which app your finger is on, even if you don't see the screen. This feature was designed for individuals who are blind or low vision and gives full access to your device. Here's how to get started. To turn voiceover on or off instantly. And we're not gonna get into those details, but you can see there that somebody that's that's blind, low vision, or needs maybe even verbal cueing to how to use that device, or wants to run any form of app on that device that has audible sounds, 
um, they can have that going right there into their ears and, and use the device, uh, uh, use the glasses with that type of technology. So it's kind of about pairing those unique things. Um, bridging apps, interesting. I, this is in the wrong spot, but we'll go through it anyway. Um, if you haven't heard of bridging apps, I would really recommend you look at it. It's uh, bridgingapps.org, I believe. Um, it's done by uh, Easter Seals Creator Houston. It's a database of 3,000 plus, I think it was 3,700 the last time I looked, apps that they have screened for applicability to serving people with disabilities. Um, they categorize these, they allow you to search for them by desired outcome, what you're trying to achieve. So if you are interested in apps to try to solve a specific um, desired outcome for a person, bridgingapps.org is a great resource. And I think that I have a little video here, but um, I'll let it play for a second. Yeah, it, you'll, you'll figure it out when you, when you get there. It's very simple. You can just search for and find apps. Um, a lot of them are, very, are free apps um, that you can, can get for free. Um, some of them are paid. You don't, you're not buying them from bridging apps. Bridging apps is just the catalog. You do have to still go get those from, from the App Store or Google Play or wherever. Um, here's another idea that um, I was kind of thinking about, like, you know, back from my group home days, um, we had you know, keys that were laying around. The keys are lost for the med cabinets and documentation that's locked up in offices and sharps and those kinds of things. Um, there's new technology, RFID. I'm sure you guys maybe even use these to get in and out of your offices that I think that we could be using in some of the homes uh, to secure some of those things. And obviously we have lots of regulatory considerations and human rights considerations that we're gonna have to go through. Um, I'm sure that everybody on the call by now has heard of Remote Supports, um, the company that I started. And actually I see that, uh, I saw that somebody on here has uh, worked with me at Rest Assured. So uh, hello, you know who you are. Um, Remote supports um, are being used across the country. Uh, there are 22 states that are funding remote supports right now. I'm looking at the state's Appendix Ks that are occurring, their uh, changes to their waiver programs across the country. And most states are allowing the use of remote supports um, at, even if they didn't have a regulation for it, they're gonna allow for that with their Appendix K am amendments. Um, because of the COVID situation, because it's such a great way to, you know, keep people distanced but supported. And getting support, and we could, I could do a whole presentation on the benefits of going to a professional company like a Rest Assured or a Synergistics or a Night Owl type of a company versus doing this DIY remote supports that you could do with Ring. Um, but it's basically the same kinds of technologies that is, could be run from an app where a family member, a friend, you as the service case manager, sorry, case manager, I'll get my Indiana terminology right. Uh, you as a case manager could um, look through you know, cameras. They, they've got motion activation so that you can get not notifications on the phone when something happens, or uh, maybe you put a camera by the door and Bob goes to out, out the door in the middle of the night to smoke, you can get a notification or mom can. You can communicate through these things to do, um, um, right from your phone through the through the Ring app, um, you can do communication. So it's almost like family or non-professional enabled remote support that can be done through Ring. And there are dozens of other uh, smart home type devices like this. Um, this is something that I just wanted to throw in there, uh, just because it's kind of fun. And I was thinking, you know, in a uh, in a work environment, workshop, something like that, that this might be kind of fun. It's this, um, it's called Beams. It's uh, it's actually a musical therapy device. I'm not 100% sure on the applicability of the therapy part, um, but it uh, it's, well, you'll see here in this video. So you kind of get the sense there, right? I mean, it's uh, it's just fun. <laughs> uh, here are some more uh, smart home type devices from another vendor that will allow for more than just remote monitoring or remote support of the environment that would actually allow the individual to control the environment themselves 
from their phone um, or from an app that they are running or could be done by someone remotely as well where you can control lighting and basically anything that is plugged in they have plugs that you can plug in and i'm sure that a lot of you have this stuff in your home um, lighting they can control the cameras you can communicate through these things so i think that smart home stuff is going to have a, a significant impact on our population the problem and the caution that i wanted to to throw out there is that it's tough right now the market for smart home things is very siloed uh, meaning that uh, you have you know google you have amazon you have ring you've got these these companies that build their own platforms and once you choose you're kind of stuck with that because they don't necessarily talk to each other uh, very easily um, i do think that in a certain amount of time uh, that, that there will either be regulatory stuff coming down from the feds or other forms of business reasons that these companies will want to start working together and that will be a great day because then we just go buy smart things and everything talks to everything so just be careful right now that you do have to be kind of silo specific and make a choice um, and we'll get into how you can do that here later on in the presentation um, this is cool uh, this is a um, smart garage door opener and my thought was in the, uh, the group home that I worked in, a lot of the individuals would go out there to smoke. And um, there were some individuals that could go out there to smoke by themselves without staff supervision. And some of the individuals obviously required a staff person to be physically there. Well, what if that staff person wants to kind of keep an eye on that person that's out there smoking by themselves, but they need to be giving Bob a, a bath or something of that nature or you know those kinds of things you could do that with this type of a thing where this is a smart garage door opener it's got a camera you can kick the lights on and off remotely um it's got motion detectors built into it where an agency could know when their vans are coming and going so all kinds of applications for for tech like this um this isn't neat and uh, this is another one of those ones that i just put in there kind of for fun uh and you cannot buy these right now um it is called foam soap and you basically what you do is you put your well let me play this real quick hello everyone i'm jenna and i'm here to show you the phone soap charger get ready to clean the lines with this universal charger and uv sanitizer just plug the device into your wall to utilize its cleansing powers inside you'll find two germicidal uv lights special uv transparent glass a usb charging compartment and enough space for even the largest smartphones so when you put your phone in there it disinfects it it's safe like that you know as we start to hand all these devices out to people that's something that i wanted to kind of bring to your attention and that was kind of a tech way to do it right is these things are the most obviously we know about this they're the most dirty things that we probably hold and we're all very concerned about cleanliness right now and not spreading disease so just a fun way to kind of think about that. But is this something that as we start to deploy more devices, and especially those devices that are passed around person to person in a home, um, we need to be thinking about that. Um, here's kind of a, a futuristic thing. Um, right now, there are cameras out there that can do facial recognition. I'm sure we've all seen it in movies, and we know that they're all over in some cities in Europe. Um, but there are actually software companies, and this one is one that I met at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show out in Las Vegas, uh, that are developing just the software that, that you can plug into any type of a camera, basically, and it will start to recognize people coming in and out. So could there be applications for this for uh, getting alerts for um, unauthorized visitors versus family members, friends, uh, case managers coming to the home? Um, could it be used for electronic visit verification in the future? So uh, could, you know, could we get alerts and pushed from some of those other cameras that we were talking about? So I mean, it's just gonna be crazy what we're gonna be able to do. Um, the next two, I'm gonna move through pretty quickly here. So this is a device that is obviously hung on a door handle that functions almost like a door sensor. Um, but you don't have to have all of the other smart home type stuff. It's just one device that's a door sensor. So if all you want to care, all you care about is did that door open or not? Did Bob leave? Did Bob not leave? Is that somebody coming into the home? Um, you can hang this thing on there. It connects to Wi-Fi. When it, the door opens, it, it detects that motion and can push an alert out to someone. You can actually communicate through this thing as well. 
And it can also function as a personal emergency response system. So it would function as a PERS system. And I would argue that in Indiana, that this would, should be, could be funded as a PERS device. Uh, here's another um, look at it. And here's another version of that, which is much smaller. Um, it's like the uh, Amazon um, buttons that you can press when you wanna reorder something, um, about that size, but you stick it on the door um, and it's got a built-in motion detector or you stick it on a medicine cabinet or you stick it on a uh, whatever, Bob's door, going to his bedroom to make sure that staff are doing bed checks at the frequency that they're supposed to or to make sure that Bob isn't getting up in the middle of the night and exiting or put it on a window if there's an elopement issue. Um, so it's kind of a 21st century version um, uh, of that. It does connect back to an app so that family and people can monitor that. And there's data there. Um, so all kinds of neat things. This gets more into um, devices for people that are blind and low vision. If you haven't heard of Microsoft AI, this is, or I'm sorry, Microsoft Seeing AI, this is amazing. And I think I have a video here. But basically, Microsoft has written an app that can run on a phone where somebody holds the phone up that is blind and it will tell them, you're in the kitchen. Your sister Sally is standing in the corner of the kitchen. It can scan barcodes. It can read text and documents. Um, it can scan currency. It can even read handwriting. Um, so let me, let me get this video queued up here. Seeing AI is a Microsoft research project for people with visual impairments. The app narrates the world around you by turning the visual world into an audible experience. Point your phone's camera, select a channel, and hear a description. The app recognizes saved friends. Jenny near top right, three feet away, describes the people around you, including their emotions. 28-year-old female wearing glasses looking happy. It reads text out loud as it comes into view, like on an envelope, Ken Lawrence, P.O. Box, or a room entrance, Conference 2005, or scan and read documents like books and letters. The app will guide you and recognize the text with its formatting. Top and Crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's almost like uh, artificial eyes. I mean, can you imagine tying that thing in with those Bose glasses so that it's not so obvious to other people that that person is getting that type of feedback. And it's almost like the person's hanging out with their glasses on looking at their phone, right? But really what they're doing is they're seeing their environment. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And, and we're gonna start to see, I think, more commercially available things like that. Um, if you all remember back to the Super Bowl um, last year, the year before, Microsoft actually had a, a paid a boatload of money to talk about how they are looking at universal design for everything that they're doing. And other companies are doing this as well, uh, incorporating principles of universal design into their, their future products. And I think we're gonna start to see more of that. So commercially available tech, I think will be a big thing in the future. Um, but there are also lots of really great things that, uh, that are designed specifically for the people that we're serving. Um, so I wanted to kind of run through a few of those as well. Um, this is uh, Smart Monitor, uh, is the name of the company. It's a smart watch that detects, uh, they can't say that it de detects seizure activities, but it detects seizures. Um, basically, the person wears this watch, it connects to an app on the phone. When seizure activity is detected, the phone can place a call, send an alert um, to family members. So for that person that may have staff, just in case there's a seizure, this may be an option. Now, obviously, there are lots of considerations that we need to talk through around that. But, you know, this could be a way to detect those seizures and reduce the reliance on, on DSPs. Um, they can also do a bunch of other things. It can detect sleep activity and tracking, heart rate, GPS location. So it's a smartwatch, right? And Apple, I think, actually has some features in their smartwatch in the latest version that can detect falls um, and um, I would, I would be surprised. Well, we're going to see these wearables get smarter and smarter, but this one is kind of a standalone device specifically designed to detect those seizure disorders and can be done. I should mention also that everything that I'm showing you today, the commercially available stuff, as well as these IDD specific things can all be purchased for around $200. I did kind of fudge up a little bit. Some of them get a little bit more expensive than 200, uh, but, but 
they're typically around $200. Um, this is a, an automated medication dispenser, um, a smart automated medication dispenser. Meds are put in, dispensed at the, the right drugs are dispensed at the right time. Um, if the drugs are not taken, alerts can be you know, sent out to family members. It actually logs in an MAR when the meds are taken, an electronic MAR. So there is gonna be a record that these meds have been taken um, and some control in helping individuals to self-administer their own medications. Um, this is Nucleus, and I was really excited to show you guys this one. Um, it's, if you think, can think of like an Amazon um, Echo Show, you know, the, the screen, the smart screen where you talk to her. I'm not gonna say her name because she'll start talking to me, but um, Nucleus is designed a device. It's very similar to that, um, except it is designed specifically for a healthcare environment where you can place these devices around one home and they can connect as a smart intercom system within one home, or they can be placed in the homes of the people that you're serving to allow them to connect out through video calls, uh, voice calls um, with family members or loved ones or friends, or their service provider organization or their case manager. Um, I was down in um, South Carolina at an organization called the Charles Lee Center, and they do case management in the state of uh, South Carolina. And they were talking to Nucleus about putting a Nucleus device in every home of every individual that uh, obviously they would have to get informed consent before they did that. But once they obtained that informed consent, putting one of these in there so they could do uh, remote uh, case management or service coordination through these things. Individuals can call out, you can call in. Um, it's basically like a video phone hanging on the wall. Um, could even be used to do remote supports in the future, I think. So and there's lots of details behind that that I'm not gonna get into. I also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, transportation. There's a company out in Colorado called AbleLink, and they created an app that is called Wayfinder. Um, and you can find that in the App Store, I believe, or on their website, which is just AbleLink. Um, but it is an app that assists an individual through navigating the community. Um, and it will give prompting when you know a specific bus is arriving. This is your bus. Go go to the corner of Fifth and Main, and there's your bus stop. Okay, wait here. Your bus is going to be the number four bus. You get on the bus. You know, and when they're on the bus, it's tracking through GPS where the person's at, um, and giving them prompting along the way to, hey, this is your bus stop. Get off. Okay, now walk down the street and go to this past subway. I mean, it gets that level of detail. And again, you could just be walking around with the device, but put those cool sunglasses on. Nobody even knows that that you're getting this feedback from a device to help you, um, you know, be as independent as possible. And I think I, I did put a video in here, but I think this is a pretty long one. I'm not sure if it actually shows anything. So we, I mean, that was keep up, uh, on time. Let's, let's see here. There might be something good. Okay, so what you're, I'm going to skip to that. What you were seeing there is actually the, the founder of the company. His name is Dan Davies. And what he was doing is he was showing someone how to use the app the first time and, and walking them through it and um, coaching them first, right? It's not like we just give them the app and put them on the bus and say, good luck, it'll tell you what to do. There's a lot of training that has to go in behind that. Um, another solution for folks that are um, blind and visually impaired, but I also think would be a really cool application for those people that may not be able, that can't read, that have a cognitive deficit. Um, this is called Way Around, and they make these little stickers that you can put all over everything, food, clothing, they've got a clothing version, you can put them on cabinets, you can put them on whatever you want to put them on, and then label what those things are. And when you hold the phone, when the person holds the phone over that thing, it will tell them what it is. This is a blue shirt. Oh, these are the garbanzo beans. These are, and, and you can, I've even seen an agency out in Kansas that put this on a, um, a van, a lift van, and it wasn't for the individuals they were serving, but it was for the staff. They put this tag there, staff walk up, 
that are maybe a new brand new person that doesn't know how to operate this lift or get the person on and they scan this tag and it gives them instructions so that they're they're reducing errors that way um, there's a workshop in kansas that i helped deploy some of these into where um, the individuals are putting these tags and this is a, um, a workshop specifically for adults that are blind low vision with with intellectual disabilities uh, but they're doing some light assembly and they're, they're putting these tags on bins so that individuals can identify parts. Um, so just lots of applications and creative ways you can use this stuff. Um, I'm sure you may have seen this. Um, it's been around for quite a while, the liftware spoon. Those people, well, I'll just play the video and you'll see exactly what it does. Simple tasks like brushing our teeth, taking a shower, and eating are part of our everyday routine. But uncontrolled hand or arm twists, bends, or movements that may be related to conditions such as cerebral palsy, spinal cord injury, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, or post-stroke deficits can make these activities frustrating and stressful experiences. What about this one? Working with patient advocates and their families, the Liftware team developed a new technology to make the various tasks of daily living wow. second nature again. We started with empowering our users to once again feed themselves with ease. So it, it counteracts the, the tremors or those hand movements so that the person can uh, feed themselves a little bit more independently. There's also that I didn't include in this presentation, um, a device called the OB robot that is actually made in Dayton, Ohio, that um, for those individuals that are quadriplegic that cannot move their arms or legs, this device can, you can place a plate underneath this robotic arm. You know, those robotic arms that you see in manufacturing environments, this is a smaller version of that with a spoon on the end. And they've programmed it in such a way that the individual can control this thing through various switches, um, uh, pressure switches or head switches, or they can tap a button on their, their armrest, uh, but it will allow them to select which food they want to eat. So it's not just gonna go down there and scoop a pile, it's gonna go down there and scoop the corn or it's gonna pick up a piece of meat. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, Pictello is a pretty cool app um, and the video here isn't the greatest, so I'll just kind of talk through this one. Uh, it, it's a, an app that you can go download. It's, it actually is a commercially available app um, and wasn't necessarily designed for people with disabilities, but it's being used pretty widely that way, which is why I put it in this bucket. Um, but you can build out these prompting sequences that walk people through various ADLs, um, giving them picture instructions. And it's not canned pictures, it's actually pictures that you upload of their environment. So if you wanted to you know, help somebody learn how to make spaghetti by themselves, you can actually walk them through the steps, showing them pictures of their own pots and pans and colanders and um, cabinets and um, helping people to learn how to do these, do these things um, themselves. Um, kind of back to medications. The device that I showed you the first time was obviously a device that was designed for one person. Obviously the people that we're serving um, oftentimes live with other people that are also taking medications. So why do we wanna have you know, four of those little dispensers placed all around the home? Um, the Libby device is actually designed to be uh, used in more of a, a congregate living setting. I hate to even use that word, but um, it's what it's for. The medications are all put inside this thing. It looks like a Keurig. Um, the person walks up, taps the button. When it's their time, they get their meds. Uh, this would require, obviously, some assistance from staff to make sure that it's the right person going up to the machine at the, at the time. There are a few others that I didn't, a few other medication dispensers that I didn't include in this presentation that actually have facial recognition built into them, like I'd showed you before um, with the people entering the building. But now the facial recognition is being used to determine, is this Bob? Do I dispense Bob's medications or is this John? So uh, the reason I didn't include that is it is kind of in its infancy. Um, and there's a whole lot of applica or, um, research behind it yet to validate that it's, uh, it's going to work, but, but it's coming. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard of uh, the health risk screening tool. Uh, they do have um, an, a program that can is designed to do a 
health evaluation to help a nurse or a person do a health evaluation so that they can be proactive about the person's health and be preventative. And I'm gonna kind of skip through that. Um, has anybody seen, um, I'm sure you probably have heard of AngelSense, the GPS tracking devices. Um, you know, that's kind of a, an area that it, it's hard to talk about because we are putting, we're not giving somebody a phone that is, that is tracking their activities like the Wayfinder that I was showing. This is actually a little tag that gets put on the person, not on their skin, on their clothing. Um, obviously, there are lots of consents and human rights considerations, but there are, I think, some applications, and they're selling a whole bunch of these uh, to, to parents right now that are home and trying to work, and their kids are getting out because they're busy working, and it's just challenging for some parents, and um, there is a video here, and I think it gets a little... It's a news story. A GPS tracking device on her son so that she can know exactly where he is. And she's not alone. So many parents are doing it. This surveillance video that shows Avante Aquendo running out of his school about two years ago is still an unforgettable sight. Tragically, Avante was found dead months later. Um, so, yes, there are applications where that these are life-saving situations, I think, that putting, uh, that using these types of things, um, you can sense my hesitation, and I think you get it. So, um, Creatability is actually an Indiana-based company um, based down there in Indianapolis. I think their office is up in Carmel. They're moving right now, but um, it will remain on that north side of Indy. Um, but they have created a bunch of different things. And if you haven't heard of Creatability, um, it's Creatability. Um, if you just search Creatability, Indianapolis Disability, you'll find it. Again, email people your uh, amy or whomever and i can get you guys more information on these things but um they've created this really cool thing that it's called avatar and I'll, i'm just gonna let this video play because it does be much better than me explaining it hi i'm david jackson with the patents project I'm the new assistant director and specialist covering augmenting and alternative communication in an orthopedic environment today we'll be hearing from steve sutter about some great apps from creatability for this month's featured solution Hi, I'm Steve Sutter with Creatability. Our goal is to create innovative products that help people with intellectual disabilities flourish beyond their current capabilities and provide solutions where it's used our personal care okay. and hygiene. I thought it was right there at the beginning. Um, but the Avatalk is an avatar that pops up on the screen in the person's home and says, hey, Bob, it's, you know, it's time to take your medication. Did you take your medication? And then two buttons appear on the screen, yes or no, right? And if Bob walks over and says yes, the avatar is, okay, thanks, Bob, whatever. But the person is interacting with an avatar um, and helping them to, to, and helping us to collect information to make sure that or do our best to make sure that some of these ADLs are occurring in the homes where the individuals may be living a little bit more independently. So some pretty cool things. Really, I would really highly recommend checking out um, Creatability's website. Okay, so I've thrown a lot of things at you here and I do wanna leave a little bit of time at the end to kind of talk about, you know, obviously there are, there are companies out there like the Rest Assures, Synergistics, Night Owls, Creatabilities, um, there's a telehealth company that's just popped up in that's serving specifically people with IDD called Station MD. Uh, that they, a group of doctors that is basically available on demand that has access to the individual's med medical records. So, in, in, can you imagine in that group home environment? And I always go back to this because I worked in a group home. That was always my biggest fear. Is, you know, how do I how do I evaluate this situation that just happened? Am I gonna make the right decision as a DSP? Am I putting this person's, and then I'm calling my supervisor, right? Because I don't wanna screw up. And then my supervisor gets bugged all the time. And so they, they've got these docs that are on demand and you walk over and hit a screen and you're talking to a doctor. Hey, Sally's got this rash and a cough, what's going on? And the doctors can be there in the home with them. So anyway, I, I got away from what I was saying. You have professional companies like, like that, those organizations that I've shown you that can, can hold your hand and walk you through these things. Uh, and then you also have the DIY option. So how do, you, how do you determine what is the best way? 
So I kind of put this little grid together here um, to kind of give you a visual representation on where uh, DIY versus pro solutions evaluation. So if you're looking for an assessment of a person's needs and trying to match them to AT, go find a pro. And I'm gonna talk about that here in just a second. Um, if you need a quick time to solution, um, you know, it's kind of, I would say go to a pro, but it's pretty close to, you know, about being even to if you want to just go buy something or go to a pro to get something and get it quickly. Um, cost is obviously going to be significantly cheaper if you go DIY. The funding is about equal uh, for both. I think that you can, you can fund some off the shelf things and do this DIY, or you can also fund some pro solutions. Um, hopefully more in the future as we discussed at the beginning of the presentation. If you're going to require some training and, and assistance with the implementation of these solutions, um, we would definitely recommend you go pro. The pro solutions tend to be more proactive in nature as opposed to reactive in nature, as many of the commercially available things are, meaning that um, they've intention, they've, they've targeted, they know how our, the people that we're serving, they know their needs better and they've specifically designed these things to be proactive and to address things prior to a situation becoming harmful or dangerous, the commercially available things tend to lead more to a reactive approach. Something has happened, let's notify somebody. Um, data trends and analysis and peace of mind and technical support. You can see this, and again, I'm happy to send this to you, but there's a lot of considerations that you need to go through, and we'll kind of get into a little bit more of that. The biggest and most important thing that you need to be thinking about, again, is the person's needs and preferences. What are, what are we trying to solve? What do they want? What type of technology would they prefer? Which type of technology can they interact with? Um, do they want technology? And so maybe the first question, but we have to, the reason I throw this in here is all these metrics and evaluations and devices and everything that's out there, we have to stay focused on the person's needs and we can't get this, this shiny object syndrome of I want to go get the latest and the greatest and apply it to the people that I serve. It's we've got to stay focused on this. So some resources for you. I'm going to move through this pretty quickly because I want to leave about uh, 15 minutes for uh, questions that you guys may have. The number one resource for tech assistance in the state of Indiana is the uh, AT Act program at Easter Seals Crossroads. These guys, this group of people, is amazing. Um, they are honestly, I've interacted with a lot of the ATAC programs around the country. They are one of the best by far. Uh, so we're very lucky to have these, these folks. Um, you can see some of the things that they're able to do for you there. They've got a lending library. They can get you devices to try before you go buy anything. They can come out and help you with an AT evaluation. They offer a bunch of trainings. A lot of them are obviously online now, um, but really great, great information coming out of Easter Seals. Um, uh, in data is the name of the project. So uh, we would really recommend connecting with those folks. Some national organizations, um, you have the uh, AT3 Center and ATAP that represent all of those state AT Act programs. They obviously collect ideas and references and solutions and things like that from across the whole country. Uh, so um, they're basically the, the trade association for all of the state AT Act programs. If you just Google AT3 Center or ATAP, uh, you'll find them. And they basically, the same things that the folks in Indiana do, but they just have information about what's occurring in other states, which is great. We need to look outside of our, uh, our state lines. So um, another area, um, this is a company from Canada that I was interacting with not long ago called Distinctability. They're looking at the applications of technology and cataloging them and trying to provide information to um, employers on the types of tech that employers need to be looking at to employ people with autism and other forms of disabilities. So there are other organizations out there that are more private organizations and not the AT Act programs that are starting to pop up because people want to make tech uh, a bigger part of people's lives. We're also seeing a lot of tech coming in from other countries. And just recently, um, I had the opportunity to talk with uh, Inlet which is a, a conglomerate of AT companies coming out of Israel that would like to provide services in the US. And there are a lot of them, a lot of them, and a lot of really cool things coming out of, of Israel. So we're gonna see a flood of new stuff coming in from not only outside the state, but outside the country. And then lastly, um, you can come to us, to me, to Disability Cocoon. 
Um, we try, our goal is to act as a catalyst to um, further the appropriate use, as I said at the very appropriate, being the key word there, the appropriate use of technology in supporting people with disabilities. The information that we have pulled together is all available at disabilitycocoon.com and everything that we're doing should be there, but just kind of run through quickly. We organized all of the information that we have into three different categories, where you come to discover, where you can come to learn about technology, and where you can come to get help with implementation. So the discover part, we do have a newsletter, we have a blog where we're putting articles about some of the tech that I was showing you today on there and new things will be posted there. Uh, social media channels where we're throwing out ideas like this all the time. Uh, we do these things called tech huddles on a weekly basis where I bring in um, companies exactly like I showed you today. And they do a 30 minute demo of their product and talk about how it's applied to supporting people with disabilities. So it's just a way for you every week to get some new idea that could inspire you um, to improve the lives of the people that you're serving. Workshops are very similar to tech huddles. They're, these are both done by Zoom. Um, but our workshops really dive into a specific area of technology and we go very deep in the workshops. Uh, so we've done a workshop on remote supports. How do we do this? We, we, have, uh, we had on a workshop scheduled for elopement technologies. Um, we will probably do a workshop around technology for medication administration. So, but we, we, these are like four or five hour long things where we really get into the details that you need, not just, hey, here's this great product, but how do we do this from a planning perspective, from a funding perspective, from redundancies and backups to the technology, and how do we make sure we're doing this right? We also hold uh, events and conferences that we call tech fests around the country. Actually held one in Indiana about a year ago, a little over a year ago. Um, and the folks at InData co-hosted that with us. But we've obviously not doing many of these conferences right now, but we do plan to kick these back into gear and hold those around the country. You'll see that the vast, in this image, there are two things here that I have not talked about. And these are two things that will become the core of what Rest Assured is. I'm sorry. Um, what Disability Cocoon is. You can tell how long I worked at that company, right? It's still kind of in the back of my mind. Uh, this is called SHIFT, and it is the country's first enabling assistive technology credentialing program for DSPs um, and those types of roles, certification program for professionals like yourselves or professionals that are working for provider organizations, and agency um, technology first accreditation standards. So it's an online learning community with online courses and projects that have to be submitted and exams that have to be taken. But we give you the skills to learn how to evaluate technologies and incorporate them into the service planning process. So this is not a technical training. This is a how do we look at tech in the scope of service planning and, and doing incorporating it the right way for the people that we serve. The reason that we call it a community is that it is going to, um, well, one, we're gonna post all of these things that we're doing and recording in, inside of here on an ongoing basis. So you'll have new information being uploaded all the time, but you can also interact with other people around the country. So if you're trying to implement a specific type of device, you can go and find a feed and say, hey, who's done this device and get help from the community of people around the country that are learning and shift. We are also going to have uh, a tech search functionality that we're building right now with our partner, um, this company out of Israel actually, called ATVisor. Uh, they've built a search platform where you can come in and say, I want to find a device that will help with seizures. And it'll spit out a list of devices that you can then evaluate at a critical level but we're trying to make it so simple for you with the service planning part here that you get the knowledge that you need on how to do it. And then you can actually go find a device that's gonna work for, again, back to that person-centered approach where we're looking at the person's desired outcomes, get recommendations, then follow your team process, go take those recommendations to the team, and all of a sudden you're the expert for the team in tech. And then the last thing that we do uh, is implementation. We do some special projects and consulting um, we're helping several states with their technology first push and obviously doing lots of presentations and trainings. So um, that is a, uh, a quick overview of what we do. There's also other resources. LifeZest is a great company. Um, they're posting all kinds of content uh, out there. 
uh, mostly geared towards self-advocates and families. Um, what we do at Disability Cocoon is typically focus more on you, professionals, right? Obviously, we have a lot of content that's going to be applicable to people and their families as well, but these folks are laser focused on uh, self-advocates and family members. So um, that here's my contact information, um, and I will kind of pause here. I think we have a little time. Um, I hope that that was on target with what you guys were looking for today. Um, as you can tell, I'm extremely excited about the impact of tech, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk with you today and um, hope everybody's doing okay in these crazy, crazy times. So I'll pause to okay, see what questions well, have. Um, We do have some questions for you. Um, hopefully you're hearing me okay. Yeah, got you. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, I think technology is good when it's working, but I question some of these items but what happens if it's not working? Um, so we'll let you address that piece first and then there's a second part. That is something that you need to address prior to the implementation of that piece of technology. How do we know, one, how do we know that it's not working? Uh, two, if it isn't working, what is our plan? And okay. if you can't get those things to line up in a way that you're ensuring that the person is not gonna be at too much risk, then you shouldn't do that tech. But those are, things that you need to, to include in the planning process in the ISP prior to implementing that technology. Good question. And then also, you know, questioning how affordable some of the items are when, you know, the individuals that we work with are living on SSI and, and don't really have money to spend on some of these things. Yeah, there are some, uh, that is a very big problem in Indiana. Unfortunately, we don't have an assistive technology definition in any of the waiver programs, like most states do, where the waiver would pay for these things. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I would really recommend you go to the InData in folks. They actually um, have some resources that where they can draw down money, uh, they can do loans, those kinds of things. Ultimately, we, we need to figure out a way that individuals are not paying. <clears throat> paying for these things we're paying for staff for them these are should be the we're paying for support i.e staff these are support they're just not staff we we as a system in indiana need to get to the point where we're funding these things for people so okay uh who makes the medication dispensers that you mentioned uh dose health out of minnesota is the first one and livy L-I-V-I -I is the second one. And they're actually at Indianapolis. Yeah, huh, very cool. Um, let's see. And we already talked about the Medicaid. And you were talking Station Maryland, right? Or Station MD, sorry, is the group of doctors? Yes. OK. And then somebody wanted a list, and we directed them to go to your website to Disability Cocoon. Um, and so then somebody said, currently, I believe most waiver consumers don't have the money. It's going to be available. Is it going to be available through waiver, which we've already talked about? That's kind of one of those issues that hopefully down the road we will start to see um, some advocating for and, and making some changes to the waiver. Um, then we had somebody say um, AT evaluations are the best. They're very knowledgeable and have a library to try out items without going into purchase items. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, do we have to have a membership to Disability Cocoon to be able to access any of your trainings? Um, no, no. Those uh, the tech huddles and the trainings and those things are just going to be posted when they're, you know, occurring and you just register. There are some. The workshops are a paid thing because it takes a lot of effort to put those together right. um, but the tech huddles and most of the stuff that we're doing is there and available for free okay that's excellent to know let me send that um, great information love to learn more great presentation great to hear no cost for these trainings lots of good information and lots of good resources and, and new things to think about but I think not only, you know, as we're dealing with some of our consumers, but even our own families, you know, and older adults, too, that we're all having at some point in our lives. So 
really appreciate your time this morning and the great, great, great information. Um, and again, you know, everybody, there's Dustin's contact information. Definitely go check out the website and, you know, access some of those tech huddles and, and some of those other things that they're putting out there because technology is definitely a great tool to use. So oh, we have one more question come in. Nope. Um, do you, oh, somebody did ask, did you say you offer certifications for case managers? Can you we're speak building, to that more? We are. Um, right now, we we're building that as we speak. Um, that should be done. Shift is launching Monday. Uh, the, that certification program is launching Monday. We're doing it in a pilot program in six states um, with like five or six different providers in each state. Uh, but we are building that uh, case management component. So there will be a certification that you can add to your uh, your title coming soon through Shift. Okay, excellent. Um, it is 10.56. Um, we'll give everyone just a minute or two just to see if any more questions come in at this last moment before we sign off. This is Joy. I have a comment um, related to the funding for all of the uh, technology devices and so forth. Dustin alluded to this, and I think Amy mentioned it slightly, but I just want to reemphasize as uh, the state of Indiana is looking at the waiver redesign, uh, it's really important that consumers and families and case managers and whoever, just random Joe Schmo, needs to be submitting public comment for the waiver redesign, um, demonstrating the importance of funding these types of technological devices. Um, as Dustin has indicated, there's there's a huge need and there's 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 tools that are available. The funding just isn't there. And if we can get the state of Indiana, the, the people that are writing the waiver uh, for the future to understand the critical nature of funding these types of things to improve the lives of people, the way for us to kind of communicate that to the right people is by submitting the public comments. And so as people have the opportunity to do that here in the coming weeks and months, it's so, so critical that we actually take advantage of that opportunity. Well, we've not had any more questions come in and I don't want to keep Dustin any longer than necessary. Um, you know, we appreciate again all the information and I'm hopeful that you'll probably see some staff from advocacy links and other great case management companies showing up on maybe some tech huddles and other things that you offer. So thank you so much and have a wonderful thank day. And thank, thank you, you all for you. joining us today. Have thank a good you. afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, Advocacy Link staff, please go ahead and go to the staff portion of the webinar. Everyone else, thank you for joining us.